Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Abbas Milani. Welcome to uh, uh, the last event of our uh, quarter. Uh, it is a little late in our quarter, as you know, but it had to do uh, not with our planning, but with the state. Dear uh, guests tonight, I would like to offer a special uh, welcome to a very dear old friend of Iranian studies at Stanford and of uh, the Republic of Letters in Iran, Mrs. Lahiji. Uh, I, I think it's far from hyperbole to say that no other woman has done more for publishing in Iran than Mrs. Lahiji. Uh, this is, I don't make this claim lightly. Uh, she has published uh, some of the best works of literature, including virtually everything that Professor Bezai has written, but she has published many, many more. She has won the most prestigious award as the best woman publisher of the world, which is not an easy task to do. Uh, and uh, I think anyone who follows the Iranian media and follows the Iranian publishing world, uh, I think knows that no one stands more for the independence of the publishing industry in Iran and for the integrity of works of art, like Mrs. Laiji. To give you a sense of her uh, true, defiant, continued resistance, I was asking her about the number of books she publishes. She said uh, last year they published about 50 books, and about 50 of her books are now languishing in the censorship. If you are a publisher, you know that to have half of your capital uh, languishing and yet continue publishing takes an enormous amount of tenacity and an enormous amount of dedication. And I think everyone who is interested in the world of letters, in the world of Persian literature, in the words of women uh, writers, in the words of Bahram uh, Beizahi's uh, writing, owes a great debt of gratitude to Mrs. Lahiji. So please welcome Mrs. Lahiji. Please, come and say a few words. Uh, yeah, that is not my night, it's night of... Every night Mrs. is your night. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's the night of Mrs. Safide Mohammadi. I am happy that I'm his uh, publisher. And uh, I think one of the duty of the old publisher of finding the talent and following the writers who be a good writer. And what I do, one of the things that I think is, is for all the publisher. But what I do and I like to do is this. Sometimes they find me harsh, but I'm not harsh. I'm very kind. <laughs> <laughs> but if you ask Mrs. Mohammedian, he will say that I am harsh. <laughs> I'm not. But uh, I, I'm happy that she is here and she will talk about this book, her book to all of you. And I'm happy because from one of her book, one of the film uh, producer came to me and asked for making a film from her book. Then that's a good opportunity. I think a few one can have this. But when Ostad Master Beza is here, we do not talk about uh, filmmaking, but sometime I was thinking to talk to him about her book. And now it will come the time, maybe next time we can show her film here. Thank you very much for your coming. I am just suddenly here because there is no program for being here talking to you, but I'm happy that I did. Welcome to Mrs. Mohammedian. Thank you, Mr. Mohammedian. The first conference I ever organized at Stanford, which was about 14 years ago, uh, I don't know what, whether Mrs. Lahiji remembers, but she was one of the guests uh, 14 years ago yeah. with Simine uh, Behbahani. And uh, there was a poor man, one of the speakers, uh, who dared talk about uh, uh, some aspects of his views, particularly on hijab, 
and I have rarely seen someone get a public spanking <laughs> the way she and Simina Behbani gave that poor guy. And he stuttered to the rest of his talk, and uh, that was my first introduction to uh, Mrs. Lahiji. Uh, so it's been a pleasure to know her, and uh, the fact that we have uh, Ms. Mohammadi here tonight is precisely because uh, uh, Ms. Lahiji recommended her as a, one of the young talents, upcoming talents in Iran. Uh, one of the things we have been trying to do at Iranian Studies at Stanford is try to invite people from inside Iran who are uh, less known uh, in the outside or who have less exposure to the outside. This is our third speaker uh, in this series. This is the third person we have invited from Iran, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Amjad was the uh, last one, uh, Aine Moradi uh, was the first lady we invited from Iran, and uh, we also had Abdul who has one foot here and one foot in Iran. So four of our last speakers in this quarter have been either from Iran or have had a foot in Iran. Uh, Ms. Lahiji is the cream on top of the uh, cake. Uh, now, uh, Sepide Mohammadian is one of this new generation of writers. Uh, I have uh, talked to her a little bit about her career and heard about her career, a rather remarkable career, uh, from uh, uh, Mrs. Lahiji. Uh, she decided at one time uh, that uh, she was going to dedicate her life to writing and become a professional writer. She had a fairly successful career as a first housewife, uh, then as a lawyer. Uh, she had some very lucrative uh, contracts with uh, corporate uh, clients, but she decided that her calling was as a novelist and with no small amount of uh, uh, encouragement uh, from Mrs. Lahiji, uh, she decided to write. And she decided to write in areas that very few people have uh, written about. Uh, one, the war, the war with Iraq, and the damage that it has done on the soul and the psyche of the people. Uh, she decided to do intensive interviews with people who have had the experience of the war. Uh, and decided to write about it. And as you can expect, the book never was published. Uh, the war, unless you praise it, is a taboo subject in Iran. To write about it in any serious matter is seriously uh, uh, prohibited. Uh, then she decided to study another uh, rarely studied subject, and that is the abuse of women in Iran. Uh, she studied it both as a sociologist, as a trained lawyer, and finally as a novelist and decided to write about it and, uh, and decided to do something about it and decided to define her own life by uh, writing uh, uh, novels. Uh, one of her, again, uh, unpublished uh, uh, books has a wonderful title, Tanava, Tanhava Raha, Alone But Free. It's about women who have been divorced but have found freedom in their divorce, but at the same time they have found an enormous life of difficulty. And she is trying to address those difficulties, both as a sociologist and as a novelist. Uh, so it is with great pleasure that uh, we welcome this young, talented lady from Iran, and hope that this will not be the last time that she visits a major university in the West. Thank you. And uh, firstly, I must thank Iranian Studies uh, and uh, Stanford University and dear Professor Abbas Milani and his colleagues for granting me this opportunity. Today I'm here to tell you a little about my work and life as a writer in Iran. As you may guess, uh, the situation for a writer or publisher in Iran is difficult. And yet, we trick on, remind, resilience, and uh, undetreat. I have written two books which the authorities have censored. 
it's difficult to put so much of yourself in your work, only for it not to see the daylight. And you may imagine that uh, this would cause a writer to lose hope. But that's certainly not what happened to me. Instead, it's just a challenge, a test for me to explore new and better ways to get from where I am to where I want to be. I'm here today to share a little bit of myself with you. In particular, I want you to, uh, to take away three things from my uh, story books. First, find your passion and never give up, reg uh, regardless of how difficult my situation. Writing is the most important things in my life. It's my passion, and I will stay true to it. Second, Iranian women authors are resilient. They are forging their identity both at home and internationally. Empowered women authors are the key to improving our lives at home and abroad. And third, seek awareness. I want to inspire women to seek awareness and find new meaning in their lives. It's too easy to settle into a present role and destiny. It's too easy to settle into your daily habits and forget to look up. So instead of looking behind you, look what is in front of you. And once more, the three things I want uh, you to remember about me and uh, my stories is first, find your passion to be resilient and strong, and three, seek awareness. Now let me tell you a little about myself. 12 years ago, when I was very young, I presented my first book to a famous publication. Although the publisher did not publish my book, they did me a great favor by introducing me to the publication Roshan Garan and Women's Studies which is a well-known in the fields of women's rights, culture, literature, and theater, and is famous for publishing Master Bahram Bezer's work. Then and now, women writers and publishers in Iran are working in difficult condition. We're getting permission for publishing a book like my latest book, The Story of Eve and the Air of Wits, takes about two years and the uphill battle gets a book published. My publisher, dear Mrs. Shahla Lahiji of Roshan Garan, is currently waiting for permission for more than 50 volumes. And of course, some of them have been censored. My first two books, The Slide Toward Hell and The Forgotten Society, are among the book banned. During my active years as a writer, I've, co um, I've cooperated with the Iranian literature section of Golestan magazine, wrote short stories, which later got published in collection Coming, Staying, and Living, and also had the opportunity to work with some women's protection groups that my mother was also in, uh, involved with as a psychologist. I have been confronted with the problems of different social classes, especially the middle class, which I put my main focus on. And I realized what's more important than narrative forms and literary richness for me is what happens to the reader at the end of the story. In other words, what's important for me as a writer is the journey my readers take and the change my stories can make in their minds and in their lives. I want to help them find their passion. Although life as a writer in Iran is sometimes difficult, but many things are getting better. In the past in Iran, there were job positions that were not considered appropriate for women and so they could not be socially accepted in those fields. But nowadays, women have active 
and dynamic uh, presence in different fields and areas in society. Women have also achieved higher levels of education during the last decade. The efforts of active female rights protectors continue steadily, thought the process still move forward slowly and within the borders of the religion's laws of country. To succeed in this world, female writers have a much more cognitive approach toward addressing women's issues and communicating their ideas with the world. They have adopted their writing style and the literary content of their work to gently and respectfully push the boundaries, boundaries of uh, what is acceptable while crafting their messages in ways that leave them still powerful and undiminished. The subject of my stories is always social issues that concern me. So I try to create a story based on the issue. And when I start writing, the storyline goes forward based on my perception and perspective of that issue. The thing here is that I must be able to find a function for this story. See what it can do, the change it can make. This approach of mine is probably a reflection of the measure I have studied, sociology and law. And so I guess that I'm always focused on the fact that the human being of our time is trying to find a new meaning in between all the information the modern world is injecting to their mind. This way of thought guides me and my writing style and pattern. Actually, I'm not known as a feminist in my country. Some people even ask me why male characters in my stories can get hurt and be written as much as the female characters who are in a search for their identity and ways to change. Based on the research I did uh, on the issue of female murder in some cultures for my latest book, The Story of Eve and the Era of Wits, I realized this angry and fierce man who commit the murder are also victims of the thoughts and limitations of their culture. As a response to that, I must say that the issue of women is not to fight the men but to find themselves a true and unique identity. Because if there is be any struggle for women to fight men, both would be loser. I think what matters the most to the people of our time is to find themselves an identity, aside from gender and sexuality. An identity that's about humanity and not gender. This is an important distinction. In finding an identity derived from our common humanity, rather than one derived from the difference in our gender, we find a way to take two powers that could easily be set against one another in a fruitless battle and unite them toward the common aim. By looking at the problem this way, we can solve many of the problems women face. Now let me tell you a little bit about some of my works. In my first book, The Slide Toward Hell, I wrote about women who had lost all her family members during the years of revolution and war. The female protagonist, the only survivor of the family, struggled to build herself a new life after the critical and eventful years of revolution and war. This book was banned and uh, it is still not published. My second book, The Forgotten Society, is about soldiers of war being kept in centurion who are suffering from different abnormalities and mental problems. The war has caused them. The story does not refer to any particular war, time, or place and just generally criticize the damage done by the war and post-war problems. This book did not get permission for 
being published as well, without any explanation. In my book, uh, The 40th Day, I wrote about vulnerable and sensitive women and her encounter with life-changing problems. In the process of this story, the female protagonist of the 40th day realized she the only one, she is the only one who should lead her life and emotions, and she's guilty of the fact that her life has been in the hands and control of men because she's the one that should fight and take control of all aspects of her life. The protagonist tries to become the hero of her own life during this process. That's metaphorically explained as uh, the process after death, process of accepting, healing, and in the end, becoming free and awakened. For my book, The Story of Eve and the Air of Wit, I did a two years of research and asked people of different ages, social classes, and education levels to fill out my questionnaire, which asked questions about family violence, suspicious, and the murder of women. And I wrote the storyline based on some true stories about such murders. In this book, the subject is not about the damage done to women, nor about gender or finding the criminals. It's about a special way of thinking and culture that affects every act down to women that ignores their rights. It's also about the times when women are stuck in a situation where their rights are being taken away from them and the question of how far the law will go to support them, which would totally affect the process and the outcome. The story shows how local beliefs that uh, are bright deep in a person's subconscious can affect their lives and actions despite the modern life they seem to be living on the surface. The function of this story for me is to try and change those false thoughts and ideas. Thought uh, the changing of culture and belief is long process that requires time and passion. The secret to this change is to seek awareness. Only when you have a good understanding of yourself, your surrounding, and the hidden forces that guide the events around you, then you can bring to change. I recently finished my latest book named Lonely and Abundant, a story that uh, depicts the life of a woman after divorce and the emotional and social change a woman experiences after she leaves her role as a married woman. The main subject is her struggle to find herself a new identity and a new role as a divorced woman in the society. She lives alone and she has many problems with money since she never thought that there would be a rainy day and doesn't have any saving. She's looking for a job. In Iran, there are problems when a single woman, divorced woman works, everyone look at her and is interested in her life. She has passed two or three years after divorce and she had a hard situation, but she started a new relationship soon after divorce. <laughs> this caused her much new pain. So after this relationship breaks apart, she wants to be alone to create space for herself and begin to start a new life. By creating space for herself, she's able to seek awareness and find her passion. Currently, I'm working on several new projects, including a book and an essay. I'm always looking for a new way to express myself through writing. 
The book, with the working title of Born August 16, focuses on communication between women's and men's words. My essay is a social approach to Iranian Oscar-winning director Asghar Farhadi's films and his perspective as a filmmaker of the middle classes, middle class women and children, and their personal and social morals on different levels. This essay is only a social approach to Asghar Farhadi's films, and I think is much different from other essays written about his cinematic techniques. Some Iranian directors have asked to make a movie movies based on my novels, because they thought my stories are visual stories, the kind which have uh, the potential to be turned into a script. I took a script uh, writing classes with one of the most prominent filmmakers of Iran, Mr. Nasser Taqwai. So when I find the time, I'd like to turn some of my novels into a script. There are so many wonderful stories uh, that can be shared, whether by book uh, or by movies. And the beauty of creating this uh, stories uh, is in almost infinite number of ways we can weave uh, together our own ideas, experience, and uh, philosophy to touch our readers' lives and ultimately make the world a better place for all men or women alike. In the end, I must kindly thank my dear professor, Mrs. Shahla Lahiji. Society surely owes her for her inexhaustible endeavor in Iranian literature and women's rights. She puts great effort, time, and passion to get permission for publishing my books and the works of other writers. Being a publisher and having a passion for writing is as Mr. Shahla Lahiji says, a very hard road with all the limitation, censorship, and personal encounters with authorities writing books. It's some sort of a law that is close to mania. In the Sanskrit language, love and mania are, sa are same word. And I can probably say that the lovers of culture and literature probably today are the maniacs of their time. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, she has promised to uh, answer some questions, but has asked me to maybe help translate. Uh, I have to make a correction of what I translated one of her novels, Tanha uh, Raha. I translated it as free uh, and alone. She translated it as uh, alone and abandoned. Yeah. There's a very big difference between <laughs> abandoned. So it's, I guess, a difference of uh, view. Uh, but uh, free and, uh, uh, is better than abandoned. Uh, who the hell are men to abandon women? Yeah. Of course, so uh, you can ask your questions in any language. She will answer in Persian, and I will try to translate for you in English. Okay. So, based on what I understood, uh, some of her books have been published. Yeah. A couple of books have been published. I want to know how books have been received by Iranian society. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's a good uh, question, but uh, the answer is not uh, related to me because it's a uh, uh, very, very complicated situation for a publisher. It's not about writers. And uh, I think uh, some of this book, one for one year, takes uh, uh, permission, and the other one, two years. I think it's a long um, process. And uh, now, most of the publisher in Iran doesn't have this passion to stay in this situation. And so they leave these works, and the starting work uh, on other works that uh, publish them is easier than this. I tell you, the society for a book, yes. channel law, uh, the fourth, do you know what's the ceremony of 40, 40 days after death? It's a big ceremony. 
but you do take Sinirua. Yeah. And um, this is very complicated that in, inside this story. So they said, as well as he knows that husband has not died, to find it in the end, but said, okay, I will think that she will die. And tomorrow I have many work to do because of the 14th of month. You know? mm -hmm. That's the key of the story. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, people liked it very much. It's the book that they want to make feel from it. It's full of passion, full of passion. And uh, the first edition was finished very soon. Thank you. I'm curious to know about your uh, personal interactions with the censors. Can you describe the process and what do they do? Do they ask you to change things? And do they have a list of requirements that you have to uh, when they told us that some uh, sometimes that they told us that uh, some books are in, uh, prohibited, uh, we tried to understand what's the reason of this. And uh, we asked them that just wrote some, for example, five reasons that this book is prohibited. But there was any answer to these uh, questions, and just uh, they uh, gave it uh, back to us that we can't get you permission. Just this. And uh, we try about this, but uh, it doesn't work. It didn't work. And uh, sometimes we can do something and publish some books, and sometimes we can't. And these books are in the archive of Roshengaran. And, uh, uh, we want to study to hopeful, we are hopeful to find a day that we can publish again. Do you ever meet with interlocutors? Do you ever meet these people? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ms. Shahla and me also, uh, we went to uh, the, that department and asked them, but anyone didn't any answer to our question and this request. It's all the story. Uh, she told me a story I think is good to, for you to know. Uh, she said that, that when she took a class about uh, writing film script, after they told her about the techniques of writing film script, they said uh, there are three things you should never put in a film. One, a woman should never be eating bananas or cucumbers. <laughs> Two, a woman should never be eating an ice cream. I don't know where the hell they got the ice cream from. <laughs> Three, the woman should never be in a bedroom. So imagine writing a film script without a woman eating bananas, ice cream, and in a bedroom. That's women the world. Women never sleep. Women never sleep. <laughs> never sleep. Uh, but the, Mrs. Lahiji is famous for going and fighting with the censors and uh, uh, quarreling and bickering. And, uh, Do any avail any progress there? Does it work? So, yeah, it's give and take. I think it's a give and take. It Is does. it give and take or just take? No, I, yes, I, I follow. I follow the, uh, you know, I never give up. <coughs> For one book, sometimes, four times I appeal, asking again. I have a list that I brought for you to, to, to see that. Now, 55 books are there, and I tell you, more than more than four times, I again and again argue about all of them because the reason is it is quite out of law. It's illegal what they say. Yeah. It is illegal about the, the rules that they have made for us. And I am after 50, 35 years being publisher. I know the red line. So I do not follow the books that will go to the censorship. But the problem is that they never, ever answer why. Why this sentence might be deleted? Why these pages? Imagine if a book, they say, just delete four pages. So what? How I can connect this part of the story to another part? It's criminally 
that are based. Makes all the publisher crazy if they want to offer something that has value. I always find Sylvester Bezoy, but they never used to censor Facebook because they know his value in Iran. Because he is not only a filmmaker or a theater director, he also is a teacher for all the people who work or study in theater. But now, for a book that had permission, this time they said, some work has to change. And I said, never, ever, I will do it. I said, because it has permission. It has permission. It had permission for years. But now they say again that it must be censored. What she's referring to, in case you don't know, that, that it used to be that if a book got permission once, then the publisher had the right to republish. Yes. In Ahmadinejad, they said, we don't care if you had passed, you must resubmit and get a new permission. That's it is permanently. It, is, it has written on this, permanently permission. So they had to follow the laws that they have. That's it or not. And that is the main problem that they all, they break the laws before everybody else. Have you seen any changes recently, like after the presidency? I don't know, but I am very optimistic. Yeah. Right. So I also, as she said, yeah. look at the forward and not to the back. And I hope one day we will <laughs> break them. <that. laughs> um, I'm just wondering, with such a huge, Iranian population now, not in Iran. Um, do your books or do other uh, writers, Iranian writers, if they uh, censor it in Iran, will they just maybe send it to Los Angeles and say, please publish it for us? And then maybe it'll wander back into Iran as well? Uh, I think so. Every writer wants it and uh, likes that uh, their books and their rights uh, can publish to, uh, uh, in other languages and uh, also have more readers in all of the world. But uh, it needs uh, to present these works to another uh, country in other languages. And of course, we are, uh, hope that uh, we can find a publisher out of Iran to publish these books in another language. What? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, no uh, it is, some of them are getting published. Uh, yeah, yeah, it may, but um, I, I think it uh, doesn't work. Uh, we need more than this, I think, because we can uh, publish it in Iran with fighting, and finally we can find, uh, um, publish this. But uh, of course, if we want to publish these books in other countries, we prefer that it be in other languages to have a more readers from the other cultures, of course. Yeah. Um, your ideas, are they generally adhered to, pardon me, this is another question, yeah. uh, by other women, by the majority of women in Iran? Is this a, uh, are your ideas on women finding their identity is that a commonly identified and believed in theme? Um, I think yes, because uh, maybe uh, sometimes media shows some uh, other um, pi uh, picture of people and other uh, side of uh, our women in the world, um, and maybe sometimes uh, show them chicken, <laughs> but they are not like that. I think the women in Iran are so strong, and they were so strong in all the um, parts of our history, and uh, I think uh, she are, uh, she, um, they are moved forward all the time. Uh, they stayed in bad situation after war, after revolution, and with every other situation in Iran, they were uh, very strong. I believe that it's the, uh, in subconscious of every woman in Iran, but we try to put, uh, get it out of their mind and 
this uh, make this potential uh, to uh, um, to them act. Um, I think it's uh, my job, my work as a writer, and I can find in every woman, every mind of women in Iran. I think. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know how you personally deal with the news of your work being not being published in my publication, uh, because I'm sure it's not an easy task. How do you handle that? Um, sometimes, when I was younger. Uh, uh, also, every woman all the time are young, but uh, that time I uh, lose my hope because uh, when uh, I was so young, uh, I need uh, to uh, sing uh, and uh, I need to. Uh, this works uh, can be seen, and uh, most things that uh, could help me to keep on was my publisher, because sometimes I gave up and I told her I couldn't continue this because uh, it doesn't work in Iran and we couldn't keep on. But now, uh, with this strong that she uh, gave me, I know that I have to be strong. Sometimes when uh, she told me that we have some problem with this book, uh, now I can handle it and I can be strong and I can be passionate to continue the fighting and uh, now I'm better than the past in the front of these problems. She says, uh, uh, he says, and she will say later. Uh, uh, he says, I, I, I'd like to know uh, what uh, uh, drives you to write. It certainly can't be just for writing. Once you describe all the obstacles, and once we recognize that uh, the way to communicate with the outside world is not limited to books, there are other means uh, available. So what is it that keeps you uh, inspired to continue writing as a woman, in spite of uh, all of these obstacles? اگه اجازه بدین من این سوال فارسی جواب بدم که با زحمتش رو با دکتر بدین طبیعتا به تعبیر شما راه های زیادی امروز وجود داره برای برقراری ارتباط با جهان هر کس در یه زمینه ای به نظر من توانمندی داره زمانی من میتونستم حقوق رو ادامه بدم و سعی کنم در زمینی حقوق فعال باشم ولی انتخاب کردم که در زمینه نوشتن و نگارش کار بکنم به این دلیل که من همین کار رو باید هوا خوشه گندم رو اول به صورت یک بررسی و یک در واقع پژوهش اجتماعی آماده کردم و خدمت خانم نایجه ارائه دادم هیچ قالب داستانی به خصوصی نداشت ولی بعد فکر کردم که گاهی اوقات همونطور که خود من از خوندن یک کار پژوهشی ممکنه یه نکاتی رو بگیرم ولی انقدر روی لایه های درونی ذهن من تاثیر نمیذاره که گاهی یک داستان میذاره و رمان میذاره و من فکر میکنم کار من اینه کار من به عنوان یک نویسنده اینه که بتونم اون چه که لمس میکنم از جهان اون چیزی که دریافت کردم در کو دریافتم رو با دیگران سهیم بشم و بله این یه چیز کاملا شخصیه نمیتونم دلیل خیلی روشن و لاجیکالی براش بیارم به خاطر اینکه اصولا اگر من آدم منطقی و لاجیکالی بودم نویسنده نمیشدم به نظر خودم و میتونستم تو فیلد دیگه ای مثل همون حقوق و وکالت موفق تر باشم 
ولی فکر میکنم تنها چیزی که در این حوزه میتونه افراد رو سرپا نگهده و در هر حوزه بهترین مثالش من فکر میکنم استاد بیزایی هستن که فکر میکنم کسی به اندازه ایشون مشقت در ایران کشیده باشه بابت نگارش و فعالیت در حوزه هنر و فرهنگ و اینو هر ایرانی میدونه در زمانه ای که دیگه من فکر میکنم شخصا اسطوره ها دیگه به دنیا نمیان و دیگه تکرار نمیشن چون اسطوره ها محصول زمان و موقعیتی بودن که دیگه تکرار نمیشه و با این همه و با این وجود به هر حال ایشون همیشه ادامه دادن چه چی چیزی جز علاقه و عشق میتونه خیلی جه ها ما خیلی چیزا رو بابتش از دست میدیم ما که چیزایی خیلی کوچیکی رو از دست دادیم ولی فقط فکر میکنم دوست داشتنه و اینکه زنان برای من اهمیت دارن نه به عنوان یک فمینیست به عنوان یک زن بخش زیادی از کتابای من از تجربه های شخصی گرفته شده طبیعتا وقتی که من درباره جدایی و زنان بعد از طلاق می نویسم امکان نداره بدون یک تجربه شخصی بتونم اون رو نگارش کنم ممکنه که همه اون تجربه سهم من نبوده باشه ولی بخش زیادی سهم من بوده و من بعد از اون شروع کردم با مراجعین مادرم که روانشناس بودن و به هر حال موارد متعدد زنان بعد از جدایی مصاحبه کردم و پیدا کردم این چیزی جز عشق به نظرم به کاری که انجام میدیم نمیطلبه من تنها جوابم اینه امیدوارم که قانه کننده باشه ستم بر سنگ سنگین از خانم شیز گوین تو گیو می دی بردن آف Uh, translating, she didn't say she was going to talk for 10 minutes and expect <laughs> me to translate it. So the burden is truly on me. <laughs> uh, she says that you're right, there are many paths, uh, but everyone must find their own strong points. Uh, at one time I thought that was law, uh, but uh, I then decided that that is not where I want to spend my life. I decided to become uh, a writer. Uh, the novel that I wrote about the plight of women was initially in the form of a monograph. It had no structure as a fiction, but then I realized that if I turn it into a fiction, it will have more effect. I realized that in my own experience, stories and works of fiction are more uh, effective. I can never write about anything that I have not personally uh, experienced. I, I feel it is my responsibility to share my own uh, experiences. There is no logic in this. Uh, uh, there is simply a matter of uh, love, and you decide to dedicate yourself to these things regardless of uh, the kind of a cost-benefit analysis. Maybe the best example is Professor Bezai. I don't think anyone has suffered as much as he has for pursuing a life in letters, but he pursued it and became a kind of mythical character in our time. It is very difficult to become a mythical character in our time, but you can only do it if you have absolute love and dedication to uh, your work. Uh, and that is what I uh, have decided I must bring into this. Uh, but I also know that uh, when I write about women, uh, I write partly about my personal experiences, but partly about the experiences of us as uh, women together. When I write about uh, the uh, cost of a divorce, I have had to have experienced it. The entire story is not my story, but I have experienced part of it, and I think that uh, uh, I, I need to share it uh, with my mother, uh, with uh, my reader. Uh, when I was uh, doing other work, I extensively interviewed some of my mother's uh, patients, uh, and I, from them I tried to find the story. And what drives the only way that it can be explained, the only logic, that there is no logic to it, the only logic of being a writer in Iran is uh, loving it, or as she said in her speech, being mad. Uh, <laughs> شاید این سوال رو بشه اینجوری مطرح کرد که ایران شبیه هیچ کدوم از کشورهای دیگه خاورمیانه نیست کشوری که در این زن پشت فرمان اتوبوس میشینه و هیچ اتفاقی نمیفته هیچ کس شلوغ نمیکنه هیچ کس کله زنی رو با گلوله نمیزنه هیچ کس نمیترسه از اینکه باشه تو ماشین بچینی که راننده اتوبوسش زنه 
she said maybe uh, this point should be also added uh, that uh, in Iran in 1948, uh, there was only one woman writer, Siminit Danishwar. There are now more than 700 women writers, and many of them have uh, uh, books published and sold in much greater number than men. Uh, Iran is a very unusual country. It's not like any other country in the Middle East. It is a country where uh, a woman bus driver can ride a bus, bus and not have a bullet put to her head, not have people flee the bus because they think it's a woman uh, writer. Uh, they're completely at ease. And this is a very important transformation that explains why Iran is different and why out of that context comes writers, young ladies, uh, younger ladies than like her. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, <laughs> as a member of the diaspora here, I don't get to have a glance at what's going on in, in that country. And I really appreciate your optimism. And of course, the comments that you just made about how women uh, are <coughs> finding their true position in that society. In fact, we just had another presentation by a reporter, Nazila Fatih. She said exactly the same thing, that uh, uh, inadvertently, women after the revolution got a chance to really come to the service. Yeah. And, uh, by the way, learn to fight. <laughs> yeah. There are many, many young writers in this country who don't get any of the work published. They don't have any censorship here, but there is such a thing called how would the market respond? <coughs> so this is a this is endemic problem everywhere. However, forgive me to ask you a personal question. Would you be able to walk in the streets of Tehran the way you are dressed? Uh, no, it's a rule that we have. Uh, had uh, a hijab and uh, clothes like this and uh, I think it's not the most important uh, for our women. Of course it's a, a impo most important that we can choose free fr in freedom uh, our way, our clothes or something like that but now it's a rule and I think uh, this rule is not like for example Saudi Arabia or other countries like that there is uh, not so forced on keep this, but uh, I think there isn't many uh, other important things that uh, we have to try to change this. And if you want to uh, try to um, work on something like this, that is completely rule of uh, based of religious in Iran. It doesn't work now. Now we can uh, s uh, find uh, some ways to something that now we can do uh, something for that. But I have to make one, uh, no, let me make one point that I think is important to bear in mind. Uh, the Islamic Republic is trying to change the rules of the game. It used to be that if women come out of Iran, the way they dress is their business. Now, if women come out of Iran and they have a plan to return back, they have to abide by the rules in Iran. That is absolute extraterritorial terror. Uh, no other country forces their citizens to dress the way the local law requires. Even in Saudi Arabia, when Saudi Arabian women come out of Saudi Arabia, they're free to dress any way they want. In Islamic Republic, if you're trying to go back, you have to uh, dress this way. And this is a new rule, and this is a new extension. Women do it all the time in Iran. You oh, just go online yeah. and look at it. Yeah, that was misunderstanding. Yeah, we can, we can, uh, going She's out very like modest this. here. <laughs> 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 yeah, we can, and I told you, uh, it's not like Arabic Saudi with a complete hijab or like that, but there is a rule that you have to use some scarf on your hair. How much? It's dependent on you. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I don't think the credit goes to the Islamic Republic. 
public because women could have been fight from the day one and they're still fighting in all different dimensions against every, they take a step, women take a step. So there is always this war between women and uh, Islamic Republic. And if, if it wasn't for women, it, we would have had Taliban in Iran. That's my belief. No, it's 35 after the revolution, 35 years after the revolution. And still there are fighting for the job. It means that it was never ever serious in Iran. And if you sometimes see that young ladies, how they cover them, <laughs> and they, it's a joke. It's not a joke. It is something that I, sometimes I, it makes me laughing. <laughs> it's a job that women have. Just like here, all the hair is out. But, but it's a job, OK. کلاه شرعی هجاب شرعی مثل کلاه شرعی their soul, you know, fighting in everywhere you can see this. I apologize for being late, maybe you covered this, but in the Soviet Union during the time when there was such censorship, there was an underground circulation. Yeah. Is that happening in Iran? Some is that. Some is that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is. Uh, just uh, it's uh, not uh, just in um, about the publishing. It's about the theater, about the music. There is underground activity in uh, many other fields. But uh, I think, and uh, some people like me think that it's our rights that we can do with a uh, freedom mind with uh, in good situation because uh, as a artist, as a writer, as a mm, uh, actor or uh, filmmaker, we have to have a good uh, space to work. Uh, we can do it underground, but uh, mm, we're fighting for uh, doing in freedom and in better situation. Because of course, if we want to do it in underground, uh, it's so much harder than this. But do you have readers and other people who are reading your work? Mm. Oh. Yeah, people follow this way too. <laughs> they find a way. Yeah. <laughs> بخاطر علاقه من به زبان فارسی باز بعد من زحمتش رو به شما بدم ولی این دفعه بعد از زیر ده دقیقه به حقیرم چیز کاری the question is that uh, uh, considering your love of writing uh, my question is who is your audience uh, wh wh who are you trying to uh, impact is it as you suggest only women of different ages if it is, then uh, one has to ask, how can you hope to change society if your only uh, readership, if your only intended readership are women? Why aren't you also uh, trying to address uh, men, the other half of society? Why aren't you including them? And together, maybe, that they can bring about the changes you want. 
فکر میکنم توی سخنرانی من مرز کردم که من به امانی که فمینیست نمیشنستم برای من این طبیعتا کارها اگه خونده بشه و اگه برحاز مطالعه بشه مشخصه که داستان برای زنان نوشته نشده در روایت هوا و خوشه گندم عملا شخصیت اصلی داستان یک مرده و من از آقایونی که کتاب رو خوندم خوندن سوال کردم و دیدم که خیلی از اونها براشون جالب بود که شخصیت مرد خوب پرداخت شده اتفاقا در روایت هوا مسئله ای که من بهش پرداختم مسئله مردان در مواجهه با مسائل زنانه نه فقط مسائل زنان در چهلم هم همینطوره در هیچ کدوم از کتاب های من امکان نداره شما بتونید کسی مردی رو پیدا کنید که محکوم شده یا زیر سوال حتی رفته فقط یک شرایط انسانیه که افراد درش گیر کردن و در تلاشن تا از این بحران روابط انسانی در بیان محور اصلا زنان نیستن شاید اینکه مسئله زنان اکسپوز میشه برای اینه که من یک زن هستم و امکان نداره که شما با من یک نویسنده بتونید خودتون رو و تجربه بی همتای فردی رو از نوشتن حذف کنید چه دلیلش فقط این باشه از uh, uh, presentation in Iran, I'm not considered a feminist writer. Uh, I am not writing only for women. In fact, uh, my book on Eve, the first uh, character of the story, the hero of the story, is a man. And many of the people who have read it think that I have developed this character rather well. M- my books are about men and women facing, this is the same about my book on the 40th, it is about men and women facing this existential problem that they f- face. Uh, I never try to condemn men in my story. They're not ever uh, under interrogation. Uh, what I try to address is the human condition that has brought all of them to this uh, uh, dilemma. Uh, and uh, I uh, write as a woman because uh, that's who I am, and you can't separate uh, who you are Um, what you write, but I don't address only women. We have time for one more question. So I think we've heard a couple of times you mentioned that you are not perceived as a Is there a very negative thing to feminism like in Iran? Is there anything that makes you feel, you know, you would prefer to not be perceived? No, 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 at all. Uh, there is a lot of filmmakers and writers in Iran that uh, the way, their ways to uh, seek awareness is uh, uh, from this channel, feminism. And uh, maybe they are uh, believe that. But it's not my uh, belief. I, I think I'm believing that there is uh, no struggle between two words, women's word and men's word. It's my ideas. Not, uh, there is um, no, no any uh, pressure on me to pretend uh, another thing. But it's my belief that uh, I can't believe that uh, if we want to try to uh, be against the men's word, It doesn't work because it's completely dependent to each other. It's about me. Maybe uh, and other people um, have a right to think in another way. I don't know. First of all, I must mention this because we all very I always say it's not uh, men our problem. We are not starting with men. When we say, I, I you know, I'm against the word of. Uh, what we call it Mark Fala. We call it something comes from up from God, some God or some uh, some father, not not political father, I mean Patriarchy. A hidden father that comes from men and women both. Women, men are uh, sacrificed the right Never mind when you have not freedom, when you have not democracy. They are the both gender that are sacrificed and not only. It's, it's my idea as well. They know me as a feminist, but I am not against the people who I bore them and I just grow them. <laughs> we did it. We did it. If they are not quite perfect, it is what 
women did. But life was not our idea. It's what our order gave to us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.